Chapter 6 David Ramsley was seen leaving his doctor's office this morning, claiming that he is in perfect health after rumors are swirling about his abilities to continue as head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, a news anchor stated. Pictures of David trying to placate a pack of reporters streaming on the television screen behind him. Speculation of David's mental health have emerged as family members reluctantly tell reporters that David's memory has been slipping for years. Mood swings, denial, and outright fabrications have been cited as part of the patriarch's personality. Max appeared on the screen, followed by reporters as he walked on a job site. Alzheimer's? No, I don't believe he has formally been diagnosed with anything. What about rumors about David's mental and emotional stability? asked a reporter. Should he be director of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals? Is he mentally fit to fill the role? Mental health was the reason he retired seven years ago, Max told them. He and Mom went on a four-month cruise to try to get him to relax and refocus. I think it may have been ordered by the doctors. Mom was worried that he was headed for a nervous breakdown. The reporters chattered after him. Look, I've said more than I intended already. Max put on his hard hat. I need all of you to vacate the premises. We're about to level this building. Remember, for all your demolition needs, call Blow It Up Demolition Company. Noah Ramsley released a general statement to the press, the anchor told viewers. In the written statement, he says, I have long known my father to be slipping mentally. Over the past years, he has become more rational, demanding, and inconsistent. He belongs in a retirement community, not as head of a multi-billion dollar company. The lack of confidence in David Ramsley continues with other family members and even former employees. The news anchor resumed his monologue. This news station has learned that Rachel Ramsley, wife of David Ramsley, has decided to grant an interview today to former tabloid reporter Sterling Denver. We have obtained rights to air the interview, and we'll have it here on New Business at this afternoon. Molson tried to pull tape off of his fingers. Somehow, it had gotten wrapped around, sticking to itself. Grimacing, he decided scissors were in order. The problem was that he was right-handed and would need to use his left hand to wield the scissors. It was not going to be easy. "'What are you doing?' Holly put down her tray, sitting at the table with him. The busy cafeteria continued to buzz around them. "'Wrapping a present?' Molson motioned to the colorful paper. "'Should be obvious.' It's a lump. Holly raised an eyebrow, examining it. I just used a lot of paper. Molson tried to maneuver the scissors without much success. And lots of tape. I can see that. What's actually under all that paper and tape? Holly turned the package over in her hands. I hope it's for a little girl. It's for my niece. Coloring pencils and books full of pictures. Nice ones, not those cheap, dopey ones that have no imagination. Molson was happy with his purchase at the craft store. The pencils become watercolor paint when wet. I'm sure she'll be very happy with it. Holly gently took away the scissors, snipping the tape that was holding Molson hostage. How are things going with you and Dad? I was surprised to see that he's your supervising doctor. Molson tried not to grimace. He searched for an answer to her question that would not be criticizing. He didn't want to complain to Holly about her father, even if her dad was worth complaining about. He's got a lot to teach me. If he would ever teach instead of just insulting, Molson thought to himself. I'm glad the two of you are getting to know each other, Holly smiled. He loves you a lot. Molson knew that much was true. He does, she agreed. Did you see the news? Rachel Ramsley is going to be interviewed. I wonder why. I'm hoping to watch it. I get off at one, frowned Molson. Since Sterling's doing the interview, I'm hoping it'll be helpful to her plan. I've rearranged a couple of appointments. We could watch it in my office, offered Holly. I'll be there, beautiful. Molson promised, pleased. She leaned over to give him a quick kiss on the cheek before leaving the cafeteria. Fred whistled. Dude, the boss's daughter? Bad idea. Nah, Molson gave a silly grin. Best idea I ever had. She's perfection. 
She is going to get you kicked out of the program, predicted Fred. Molson chose not to answer. So far, he knew that Fielding did not have a clue. The minute he did, Fielding would come down harder on Molson than he already was. Just after one, Molson shut Holly's office door behind him, slumping gratefully onto the couch. Did I miss anything? Shh, Holly warned him. She had her laptop on a chair facing the couch, tuned to the new business network. The anchor was describing what was to come. It's almost ready to start. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders, concentrating on the screen as the view changed to Sterling Denver. Thank you. Sterling did not smile, a serious demeanor emanating from her. Today I was asked to interview Rachel Ramsley, wife of David Ramsley. Rachel has graciously agreed to give an interview about the rumors of David's health, his reinstatement as head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, and her son Michael's imprisonment. Thank you for coming, Rachel. Rachel nodded regally. Just in her eighties, she was neatly dressed, but frail-looking. Her eyes gazed intelligently at Sterling. "'Please tell me a little about how you met David Ramsley,' Sterling asked gently. "'I was very young,' began Rachel. "'I was also impressionable. My parents wished for a good match for me. When David took an interest, he was encouraged.' He came from a good family, and my parents approved of him. David can be very charming when the occasion needs it. But that's just a facade? questioned Sterling. Yes. Rachel took a deep breath. It didn't take long for me to understand that David is manipulative and selfish. He expects to get his way all the time. He looks for ways to make people feel small, to push them to do what he wants, to get what he wants— while he never physically harmed me, David made it very clear that if I left him, he would maintain custody of our children, and I would never see them again. It was a different time. There weren't the support systems for women back then that there are now. Back then a wife simply ignored bad behavior on the part of her husband as best as she could. "'What sort of behavior?' inquired Sterling." David had multiple affairs. He has illegitimate children, Rachel stated calmly. She smiled a little. I'm supposed to pretend I don't know about it. So many of us wives do that at the club. We pretend we have the perfect husband, perfect children, perfect lives. We wrap up our bodies and homes in fashion and glitter, but we cannot cover what is really happening. It is there for everyone to know. We just will not talk about it. We're too classy. David was disloyal to you in your marriage, reiterated Sterling. Yes. Could you have left him when the children were grown, wondered Sterling. Then custody would not be an issue. Why stay? I had been the perfect housewife for so long, I was not sure how to be anything else. Divorce was still frowned upon, admitted Rachel. It takes a very brave woman to leave a situation that she should. It takes a brave woman to stay in a marriage, working or not. I also foolishly thought I could mitigate the damage that David might do in his son's lives. I did my best to counsel the boys to be better than their father, to have a sense of duty, honor, loyalty, that love and goodness were more important than anything else. If I had left, I would have given up any influence I had in their lives. I firmly believe that David would have done his best to keep them away from me, and David always gets what he wants. You have to understand, Rachel frowned thoughtfully. I believe the clinical term is sociopath. David doesn't feel things like a regular person. He does not have empathy. He cannot feel sorry for someone. It's just not possible for him. That makes all the people around him tools to be used. He's always been power-hungry, and it's gotten worse in his old age. David truly believes that he can get away with anything. He thinks he is invincible, that he'll live forever and basically rule his corner of the world. He is quite mad. Do you fear repercussions for talking out today? gently inquired Sterling. No, Rachel gave a delicate sigh. I'm sure that there will be repercussions. David won't take my betrayal lightly. However, I no longer fear him. 
I've left him. You've left him? echoed a surprised Sterling. When Michael was put in prison on that trumped-up nonsense, I confronted David about his part. He boasted about pointing the finger at Michael, that he was now free and Michael was paying for forcing David to retire. Anyone who knows Michael would realize that he would never be involved in any criminal activities. He's as upright as they come. He's sweet and gentle. He's a good lawyer and would never have risked his career. Michael had more than enough money, inherited from my father. He didn't need to involve himself in drug smuggling. I know my son is innocent, and I know that David was behind Michael's arrest. Sterling leaned forward in her chair. Do you have any proof? No, I wish I did. When I learned what he had done, I packed a bag and I told David I was going to stay with Anne. Anne was pregnant at the time, and now she was alone, with Michael being incarcerated. David was livid. He does not like Anne, Rachel told her. I simply left. I plan on enjoying my beautiful grandbabies. What has David's mental health been like lately? Sterling questioned. He has become more vindictive, Rachel responded. David continues to lay on the charm and manipulation when he needs to, but... He's moodier. He's very intent on punishing anyone he believes has done him wrong. I'm not certain he can tell the difference between the reality of someone slighting him or his own imagination. He's now a little paranoid. That's new behavior for him. How is he paranoid? Sterling's tilted her head to the side as she shuffled through her notes. He claims someone is listening in on the phone. Rachel scoffed that people are tracking his every move. Are they? No, he's just being silly. Do you believe that he should be running a business? Is he competent enough to manage a multi-billion dollar company? Asked Sterling. No, Rachel promptly replied. He's old. David is not in his right frame of mind. He will prioritize his own agenda over the company's good. Have you taken any legal steps to distance yourself from your husband? she queried gently. Rachel took a deep breath. I still have it in my head that good girls do not divorce their husbands. However, I do believe that a man is supposed to protect his wife, and she is to return the gesture. Any man that abuses his wife physically or mentally should find himself alone. Today I filed for separation from David. Do you have anything else that you'd like to tell our viewers? Sterling wanted to know. I would like to apologize to my children for not being strong enough to simply whisk you away when you were younger. I should have protected you better from your father. I apologize to the shareholders, because no doubt the stocks of Ramsley Pharma will take another dip from what I've just disclosed. I have no confidence in my husband as head of the company. I apologize to any woman who thought I was an example to be looked up to. I suppose I deceived both of us for a while. Mostly, I apologize to dear Michael, who should not be in jail, missing out on his wife and daughter's lives. Rachel took a tissue that Sterling offered, dabbing at her eyes. She sniffed delicately. Are we done? Yes, thank you for your time, Sterling said with sympathy. Holly turned down the sound as the anchor reiterated key points of the interview. He then pulled up a graphic of the company's stock, which was not faring well. Wow, Molson breathed. I didn't expect the missus herself to get involved against Pop. You really are one of David Ramsley's kids, Holly molded over. What, you didn't think I was telling the truth? Molson raised an eyebrow. Not that, I guess it just didn't sink in before now, shrugged Holly. Illegitimate kids, clarified Molson. That means I got no right to the dough the Ramsley family is swimming in. Too bad, teased Holly. Then I could be a fortune hunter. Molson rolled his eyes. He filled her in on what had happened earlier that day at Max Ramsley's condo and the conversation between the Ramsleys and Sterling. Then this is part of the campaign to raise the heat on David, Holly smiled. If we're lucky, it will work, said Molson. It will work, Holly was certain. She kissed Molson, acknowledging that he was addictive. Reluctantly, Molson pulled away. I gotta work at the shop. Plus, I better check in on Ma. 
What is wrong with your mother? Holly was curious. Is she okay? Molson grimaced. She's got a few issues. I pop in whenever I can to help her out. That's nice of you. Holly was concerned, but not sure she should pry. They were still getting to know each other. Maybe I could meet her sometime. It's only fair you've met my dad. Maybe. Molson decided not to commit to anything just yet. Taking Holly on his rounds was one thing. Having her meet Margot? That was another thing entirely. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Holly frowned as she watched Molson head out the door. Hesitating for only a moment, she called Bethany. A short while later, Holly was nervously waiting at a cute little coffee shop. Bethany had agreed to meet her there. "'Can I get you anything?' a short woman with blue hair asked. "'A muffin and tea?' Holly was really not that hungry. It would seem odd, though, if she refused to order. "'What kind?' the girl raised a pierced eyebrow. "'Surprise me!' Holly gave a tight smile. "'Okay, don't blame me if you don't like it,' she left. Holly took off her coat and sat down. She was facing the entrance, so she saw when Bethany entered the cafe. "'Bethany!' Bethany's face lit up as she spotted Holly. "'Dr. Ershman, I'm so pleased to see you again. "'Please call me Holly. You're no longer a patient of mine.' Holly smiled. "'Have a seat.' The waitress plunked down a muffin and mug. "'What can I get for you?' I'll have the same milk she's having, Bethany smiled. Another surprise coming up, the woman laughed. Holly eyed the muffin. It did not exactly proclaim what sort it was. How have you been? Good, gushed Bethany. I can finally sleep. I am not on any medications. I feel wonderful. No more nightmares? Holly was curious. No. It's like my brain shut them off within a month of understanding what was really happening on that boat. Bethany replied. She thanked the waitress for her muffin and tea. My mind feels clear. I've never been happier. I'm so glad. Holly was. She liked Bethany and only wished her the best. Holly stirred her tea, pulling out the bag. She took a cautious sip and was pleasantly surprised by an orange and pineapple taste. She checked the packet. Orange, kiwi, and pineapple. I can't taste the kiwi. Bethany frowned a little, then shrugged. Then again, kiwi doesn't taste like much anyways. I heard you were engaged, gently inquired Holly. Bethany smiled happily. The detective who was investigating my case, Andrew Colburn? Drew is amazing. I love him very much. Holly remembered when Bethany had described first meeting Drew to Holly. She said that the man was rude and intimidating. Now Bethany was singing his praises. She had obviously changed her mind. Part of Holly wanted to counsel Bethany to be cautious. She hoped it was not a case of hero worship, because Bethany was bound to be disappointed. However, Holly had given her word to Molson that she would not say anything against the relationship, and she would honor that. She sipped some more of the tea. What is his mother like? Bethany frowned, surprised at the change in subject. Why? She had not been very subtle, Holly reflected ruefully. I have a bit of a confession. I've been seeing Drew's brother, Bolson. What? Bethany looked at her in shock. You! And Molson! Yes, Holly replied. She tried a bite of the muffin and almost groaned in pleasure. Chocolate on chocolate on chocolate. She was not sure it should be classified as a muffin. It was too good. Can we get back to their mother? What was she like? Why is Molson reluctant to talk about her? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Bethany leaned in a little closer. You and Molson Colburn, Drew's younger brother. Holly tried to look cool about the whole thing. She knew it would seem unconventional, with Molson looking like he belonged to a street gang and her in pencil skirts plus a doctor's coat much of the time. Her fingers plucked another piece of muffin and popped it into her mouth as she tried not to blush. Was that a raspberry? This had just become her new favorite dessert. I like him. You like Molson? Bethany snapped her mouth shut. I admit I cannot imagine it. Where did the two of you even meet? 
Originally, when you were overdosing from the medication someone forged on my prescription pad, Holly grimaced at the memory. I do apologize for that. I'm not sure how anyone got a hold of that pad. It should never have happened. That's not your fault, Bethany assured her. You didn't write those prescriptions, and if I'd had a, more of a backbone back then, I would never have allowed my father into wheedling me into taking those pills. Then, when I was drugged up, I'm sure he or David Ramsley fed me more. None of that was your doing. I still feel guilty for it, Holly sighed. You should not, nor do I hold you responsible, Bethany told her. Now, dish about Molson. Have you two been seeing each other since then? Because he has not said a word. Holly smiled. No, we ran into each other at the hospital. I asked about you, we got to talking, and I've gotten to know him better. We went on a date, and it was fun. I think I am still in shock, Bethany breathed popping in a bite of muffin. These are delicious. I want the recipe. You bake? Holly was a little surprised. During their sessions, Bethany had never mentioned a hobby. Bake, cook. Bethany waved her hand dismissively. What is he like as a boyfriend? Is he your boyfriend? We've not defined anything yet, Holly responded. She liked that they were conversing as friends. She hoped Bethany would like to continue the relationship. However, I think he likes me as much as I like him. We could end up being sisters-in-law, Bethany pointed out. You have to come to the wedding. Be Molson's date. Sisters-in-law, chuckled Holly. I think that's a bit premature. We just started to figure each other out. I bet it was the bad boy image that got you, mused Bethany. I liked that about Drew. I also liked that he was a cop. It was two attractive things rolled into one. I think that it was he could not stop flirting or keep his hands off of me, Holly admitted. Plus, he has a sense of honor. Molson wants to do the right thing. He's committed to it. That really speaks to me. Colburn men, Bethany toasted her with her tea. Colburn men, echoed Holly. About my original question, what is up with their mother? Bethany rolled her eyes. Drew won't let me meet her. Pardon? Why? Holly's brow puckered as she frowned. He calls her Wacko Margot and has outright said that she's crazy. Bethany shrugged. I get the feeling she's heavily medicated for everyone's protection. Drew's told me some interesting stories. What kind of stories? Holly was starting to understand Molson's hesitation to talk about his mother. Let me think. Bethany tapped her finger against her cheek. They were playing cops and robbers with her in the park once, and she tied Jana to a tree. And, prompted Holly, they left her there overnight, Bethany said ruefully. The real cops brought her home. Margot lied and told the cops some of Jana's playmates must have done it. Holly blinked. That is child abuse. I get the feeling she's not exactly mentally competent. I'm surprised they all survived childhood. Molson once mentioned sledding races down the stairs, Bethany told her. Every time Molson comes over, he eats like he's starving. I ran out of milk once, and he ate cereal with water, told me it was just how his mom made it. That is beyond gross. Holly could not imagine the taste of soggy, waterlogged cereal. Considering how Drew was relying on Jana for food, and Molson tends to rely on Drew for a stocked kitchen, I decided to start cooking something decent. Bethany sipped the last of her tea. It really is true. The way to keep a man is to feed him well. How are your cooking skills? I might have to brush up. Holly made a face. Water with cereal? Bethany nodded. There were screams of delight from the kids. Molson smiled with amusement as he knocked on Jana's door. The party must be in full swing already for Jenny's birthday. It sounded like they were having fun. Miguel answered the door, a party hat on his head. Molson, we weren't expecting you. Just wanted to say hi to the birthday girl and drop off her gift. Molson motioned to the brightly wrapped, lumpy package he carried. Now is probably not a good time. Miguel took off the party hat. 
closing the door behind himself. It's Jenny's birthday. When's a better time? Molson frowned. Jenna's not exactly happy with you right now, Miguel reluctantly informed him. We've talked a lot about you lately. So? questioned Molson. She does not want you near the kids, Miguel stated baldly. Say again? Molson was certain he had not heard his brother-in-law correctly. She don't want me near her kids. That's right, Miguel said firmly. We do not believe you are a fit role model to have around our children. A fit role model? What does that even mean? Molson was caught off guard. So you're telling me I can't see my nieces and nephew? I'm their uncle. What is taking so long? The door to the apartment opened, Jana coming to investigate. She paused when she saw her brother. Molson? Is this true? Molson asked disbelievingly. You don't want me around the kids. Miguel and Jana exchanged looks. That's right, Jana briskly responded. You have gang connections. You work at that chop shop. You're always coming and going as you please while you mooch off of people. And you have a bad attitude. I have had enough. I don't want your bad habits to rub off on the kids. I am not having Jenny or Kara think that it's okay to date a gangbanger. I am not having my baby boy follow in his uncle's footsteps. The auto shop is legal. Everything we do there is legal, Molson glowered. I ain't got no full gang connections. If you didn't like me dropping in uninvited, you could have just said something. No gang connections? Jana huffed sarcastically. What is with the tattoos on your neck? They're gang tattoos. There is a connection. Maybe if you'd ask, I'd tell you what they was about, Molson returned angrily. Instead of you just assume you know, you think you know everything. I know that you are no good for my kids, Jana heatedly responded. So that's it, Molson ground out. You're just kicking me out. Yes, nodded Jana. She sighed. Molson, you're not a teenager anymore. You need to stop rebelling against society, grow up, and take responsibility for your life. Grow up. Take responsibility. Molson choked out the words. He thought that this was something funny coming out of Jana's mouth, considering he was the one that was responsible for their mother, and no one else wanted to step up. I ain't been doing nothing but being grown up and responsible for years. Who else looks after Ma? Don't see you there. I ain't never missed a day of work. You mooch off of people. You couch surf. Jana listed his flaws. What's with the way you talk? I know you can talk better than this. I know because I half raised you. You just adopted the speech of those friends you used to have, those bums. Speak normally. Get your own place. Stop wearing scrub bottoms and hoodies. Get your tattoos removed. Then we'll talk about your being in the children's lives. You sure you want to lay down ultimatums? Molson questions. Because maybe your attitude stinks and you should get a new one. I have to do what is best for my family, Jana told him. I thought I was part of your family, he challenged. We need to get back to the party, Miguel interrupted them. The kids cannot be left unsupervised. Tell Jenny I said happy birthday, he said bitterly. Molson shoved the package at Miguel before he walked away. If you enjoyed this chapter of Unlikely Hero, Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 7. Also, please consider subscribing to the channel. This ensures that you will know all about each chapter as it's dropped each week, and you won't miss anything. Have a great day, and happy listening!